Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Mosaic Company. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Soil School. Today, we're going to look at how different tillage implements move soil and incorporate the fertilizer farmers broadcast on their fields. For this, we travel to the University of Guelph's Ridgetown campus to catch up with crop innovation specialist Ian McDonald. From strip-till units to cultivators and high-speed disks, Ian examines how tillage choices impact soil movement, fertilizer incorporation, and the availability of those valuable nutrients. This is a spring tillage demonstration happening in uh, July and what we're trying to do is simulate the movement of soil as a function of different implements and how broadcast fertilizers might be incorporated by different uh, types of implements in terms of their configuration, the amount of uh, total width that they actually till the ground, uh, the speed and these types of things. All factors associated with the 5R of tillage that Jim Boke and I are trying to promote as a, a different way of looking at uh, our decision making process around tillage. So in the first case here, <clears throat> what we did was we came out and we laid down a line of, sea, of just commercial corn and then we uh, did moved all the implements from north to south so that the movement of the corn, which is a substitute for both fertilizer, broadcast fertilizer and soil, uh, would all be happening in the same direction. And so this first treatment we're looking at is just a no-till corn planter put in the ground. And you can see at this point here that it really doesn't move the corn very much. It does incorporate the corn where the corn row units go through, uh, which you would expect. One important part of this is that we have this analogy or this sort of um, paradigm of what a, a ground should look like before we plant it. And what I want people to think about is this ground where the disc openers actually go and we look at that without thinking about the space between the corn rows, there's a lot of tillage and a lot of seed bread prep in there that's going to accommodate my 34,000 seeds that I'm going to put in that acre of ground. And we seem to worry an awful lot about this space in between. And we've got that little seed that's going in there and it needs to have an environment that lets it uh, germinate absorb nutrients and moisture, have ability to push its root systems out and its uh, um, stems out in, in an unrestricted manner, and then it can start to populate the other area. But early on, we're most concerned about this area and we wanna do it so that those conditions are perfect. So then as we move along, we're looking at different levels of tillage intensity to meet different people's expectation of what they need. And using that thoughtful process about why am I tilling? What do I need to consider in terms of what my end goal is and choosing the right implement, the right setup, the right timing, etc. Here we've got a strip tiller and it's a, a, a coulter machine that was used. You see that the band is wider than the corn planter itself, but it's still moving stuff, but not very far. Uh, and it's, so it's not a good incorporation tool, but it's a great prep tool ahead of a corn planter where you feel that you need that to warm up and dry out the soil. And some people are using it in the fall, some people are using it in the spring. This is a spring analogy. The next treatment we look at is a very common secondary tool to primary tillage. It's the s tine cultivator. And again, the line of corn was here, and you can see how much corn has been moved, both in terms of overall length and the distribution. It's pretty darn even as it's moved that. And so that's indicative of really good incorporation of our uh, fertilizers and of our uh, pesticides and stuff like that. <clears throat> but you'll also notice it moves soil, which is being represented by the corn as well. So there's quite a bit of tillage. We talk about tillage erosion. Anybody that's got knolls is aware of the impact of that. And we're just trying to show how choice of implement associated with speed and depth can impact the amount of soil movement and stuff. We move on to sea shank cultivator. Some people don't know it very well. It is a very common implement in agriculture areas. This one didn't have harrows on the back of it, which doesn't show as much as it, it should in a normal condition, but it still shows you that it's a more aggressive tillage tool and it moves the fertilizer more and it moves the um, 
corn further redneck again analogous to soil movement maybe not doing quite as good an incorporation because again of the setup of that tool relative to the s tine cultivator then we move to the rts machine look at the distribution of the corn it didn't move the soil near as much it doesn't incorporate fertilizer like some of the other implements this application of um, the RTS in this situation is more than I'm used to aggressive wise because it's got one set of one inch wavy um, blades on the front and two inch wavies on the back and it's got um, injection teeth for anhydrous or liquid fertilizer giving it more tillage than what we would normally expect from a single pass of uh, RTS machine. <clears throat> the next two are our um, high speed disc and in this case, we ran it at five mile an hour and eight mile an hour, and we were limited to eight based on the tractor that we had. <clears throat> and most people operate them at, you know, 11 to 14 mile an hour. And so if, if this is the point of movement of the corn at the five mile an hour uh, level, and this is the point on the eight mile an hour, think about how much soil movement is happening if you're at that 12 to 14 mile an hour scenario in terms of <clears throat> soil. So great incorporation, uh, great weed control, it's full coverage, it tends to be shallow, but also look at the <clears throat> texture of the soil between the five and the eight. There's more granulation, it's more uh, rough surface than here at the eight. That harrow on the back of these high speed discs really pounds that soil. And, and that's where I have concerns with these types of tools used in the fall without prep for cover crops or winter cereals or winter canola, where you're going to have a crop system quickly growing to stabilize that soil that you've unconsolidated and now are, have made it very susceptible to erosion. Used in the spring when you're going to be growing a fast growing crop, really not a problem, but we just have to be thoughtful of when we use it, how we use it. And some of them have uh, adjustment ability, others don't. And I would really encourage people to look to those tools that you can adjust in terms of curvature this way and curvature this way to get the type of surface uh, that you want in terms of its uh, susceptibility or tolerance to crusting and erosion, etc. So last night I was out here setting up for the demonstration day and I had my drone out and I went at 10, 25, 50, 100 and 200 feet. And it was just, you know, so um, light bulb moment in terms of looking at this, even at 200 feet, I could see the movement of the corn distinctly across each treatment. At each of those heights above, I could see the difference in the surface that was left by the running of each of these implements. And it was really knowledge making in terms of seeing it at the whole scale instead of just looking at it uh, at this one angle that we do when we're walking across plots. So I think looking at those pictures really help us comprehend, you know, the difference in, in the, the impact of tillage decisions.